The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. If near-death experiences are part of God's plan, are they talked about in the Bible? A neighborhood church teaches that only those who acknowledge Jesus as their Savior can go to heaven. Why do near-death experiences of heaven happen to people of other beliefs as well? St. Paul says we are given to live but once. Why do many ND ears come back believing in the possibility of reincarnation? Welcome to Ion's NDE Radio, presented each Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time here at Talk Zone. My name is Lee Whitting, the host of this program brought to you by the International Association for Near-Death Studies. My thanks to Joel Smitherman for this morning's opening theme music. If you missed last week's program, let me remind you that NDE Radio shows will be archived at our website, nderadio.org, and through the International Association for Near-Death Studies website, their homepage is ians, I-A-N-D-S, dot org. If you did catch our first show, you may remember that I serve as chaplain at a hospital in Maine. And though I've spoken with hundreds of patients who have had NDEs, and though I've had a near-death experience myself, I can't emphasize enough how important our religious faiths are to each of us. For this reason, a near-death experience can seem confusing to some. For example, to someone who has been taught that our souls sleep until Jesus wakes us at the second coming, For those folks who have had an NDE, soul sleep is hardly the experience they report. So if a family member or friend should tell you they have had an out-of-body or near-death experience, and it seems to conflict with what they've been taught about God and heaven, should you tell them that they are wrong or confused or being influenced by dreams or medications? The short answer is no, even though what they report may conflict with what they or you believe to be true. I've described this as happening to somebody else because when it happens to you, there's little doubt the near-death experience is real. We all know what dreams, imagination, and even hallucinations feel like, and we can question their relevance. NDEs simply feel like the truth. Consider for a moment the sources for all the literature our various faiths hold to be sacred. There's the Torah and the rest of the Old Testament the New Testament, the Koran, the Bhagavad Gita, and literally thousands more inspired works. Now, where did these texts come from? Well, most religions claim the ones they hold sacred were written down by men and women guided by the hand of truth, be it called God, Yahweh, Allah, Jesus, Buddha, the Holy Spirit, Ganesh, whatever. Some, like Moses, met Yahweh in a burning bush or in a tent where the Ark of the Covenant was housed on Mount Sinai. Some prophets heard a still, small voice. Some walked with Jesus and wrote down what he taught. Mohammed and Joseph Smith reported seeing angels and getting messages from them. Now, no doubt, some so-called religious writings are fraudulent, schemes perhaps cooked up by dishonest people seeking personal power, wealth, or fame. But others are the real thing, and the writers, as they wrote, knew their work was inspired by God. You just know a mystical experience when you've had one. Likewise, not every book that's been written about near death has the ring of truth to it. Some see a market and go for it, writing fiction where they don't have the facts. But why bother to publish every near-death experience, I say, when there are so many true NDE stories out there being told person to person? The history of Jesus was pared down to four Gospels, each telling the same story, but even then with different emphasis and different points of view. Likewise, most NDEers tell the same story, but from their very personal points of view. We don't want to honor only the published accounts when such revelations are being spread by word of mouth throughout the communities of the world every day. In part, I hope that's what this radio show will be here to offer, an easy medium for relating many personal stories of mystical experience. Now, some Protestant denominations argue that the book is closed and only the Bible can be considered the God-inspired word of truth. Yet, the book of Enoch, written before Christ, was perhaps the most popular text in Jesus' day and was 
no doubt read and commented on by Jesus himself. So why was Enoch excluded from European Bibles and then included in the Ethiopian text? In fact, many texts were left out by the church fathers of the third century. And some church fathers themselves, such as a brilliant, as some as brilliant as Origen, who, who believed in the possibility of reincarnation, were excluded from the decision process altogether. So the question stands, were the men who decided which books to include in the Bible guided by God as much as were the original authors? Even the Catholics include some books the Protestants do not. It's a question that can only be decided by scholarship and by faith. One thing I must say about the Roman Catholic Church, however, is the fact that they've been open to the visions and heavily communications that come through the saints. Visions of Mary, Jesus, heaven, and the light of God have all been given to us through miraculous communication, many, no doubt, of a near-death or out-of-body experience nature, and proclaimed by the Church, after careful review, to be true. Now let's look for a moment at St. Paul, the the major theological player in defining the meaning of what the coming of Jesus meant to the world. Paul was an angry Hebrew Pharisee and a Roman citizen to start with, and he personally oversaw the persecutions and deaths of early Christian martyrs. He was following the law of Moses and the prophets, and the book was closed for him. Christians were heretics. And then Paul had a mystical, near-death-like experience, and suddenly everything changed. He saw and spoke with Jesus, even though Jesus had ascended to heaven. Paul later wrote about his experience to the church in Corinth. Quote, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. But then the book of Acts, chapter 9, is permitted to tell us that Paul, while on the road to Damascus, is, was given a vision of the light so powerful it knocks him down and blinds him for a time. And out of this light, Jesus reprimands him for the persecutions of Christians. That vision changed Paul's whole life and established Christianity as we know it today. But now, here's a contemporary NDE that reports the vision of Jesus that changed a life. A patient in the hospital told me this and told me to tell others about her experience. She said, I careened off the road into a tree. It was a terrible accident. I found myself standing outside the car, looking in at my body, crushed behind the steering wheel. Suddenly I turned, and there was Jesus. Now, I was never a Christian or even religious. I didn't know anything about Jesus, but I instantly knew it was him. He told me, it's not your time yet. And suddenly I was back in my body. The pain was overwhelming. They said in rehab that I probably would never walk again. And yet, two weeks later, she walked out of the hospital under her own power. The doctors said it was a miracle, and she believes that for sure. She also knows who to thank for her healing. Now, as a near-death or mystical experience changed the direction of Paul's life and created a whole new text and basis for a worldwide religious belief, so too did this woman's newly found belief in the power and love of God rewrite her life as well. <clears throat> We're going to take a break now, and when we return, we'll be speaking with Nancy Evans Bush, the author of the excellent new book, Dancing Past the Dark. So stay tuned. Welcome back to NDE Radio on TalkZone.com. Here's Lee Whitting. We're speaking today. We're speaking today with Nancy Evans Bush, the author of an exciting new book, Dancing Past the Dark: Distressing Near-Death Experiences. I consider Nancy to be a leading theologian on the subject of NDEs, and I'm honored to have her with us today. Nancy, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Lee. Great. That's great. Um, I, I wanted to start today. We're not really talking about. Um, 
the topic of your book, but there are so many theological questions covered in it that it was, I thought, much broader than simply the distressing your death experience theme. Um, Nancy, so many people these days are saying, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Are they missing something here? Well, um, <laughs> I think so. And what I think they are missing is the value of story. Basically, um, a, any religion is based around a story. And stories are like the baskets in which we carry our meanings. So they give us a way of shorthand. They give us a way of talking about our experiences. So with with the woman, for example, who said um, she encountered the figure, he didn't announce himself, but she knew immediately it was Jesus. Jesus is part of her story. So what a religion gives us is a vocabulary in which to express what it is we've experienced and how we feel about it. For people who say, I'm only spiritual, but they don't say only, I'm spiritual but not religious, um, they have to invent their own vocabulary. And whereas those of us who who do claim a religion have usually centuries of of other people's words and experience to draw on. Um, I would be hard pressed to know how to express my spirituality without borrowing from my tradition. If it were just up to me, it would be just a little thin piece of itself. So many of the, uh, especially younger people that I have encountered in the hospital, have not been raised with any religious tradition. They never went to Sunday school. Uh, they never read the Bible. And their parents probably never told them about what Sunday school training they'd had. And so I find them wandering off into things like uh, vampires and werewolves and uh, um, zombies. It seems yeah. to be the, the, the hot button these days because... I guess because there's some sort of a, a, a need to identify with the supernatural. Oh, very much so. I, I think no matter how much um, we try to persuade ourselves that we are scientifically minded and objective, um, we've got thousands of years of human experience that says somehow in whatever language we talk about it, we're, we're reaching for what I term the more, whether you call it God, whether you call it spirit, or just woo-woo stuff. Um, <laughs> it, there's, it, there is more than the physical the physical world, which is why so many people um, are so changed by NDEs, because just as as for Paul, what the experience does is completely explode the person's previous sense of reality. It's right like, now, go ahead. I was just going to say now when. The, the story that they tell of their NDE collides with the story that they learned from Sunday school. Um, oftentimes, the um, personal experience overwhelms whatever they'd been taught before, and they lose, um, well, I don't want to use the word faith, but they lose faith in their religion, basically, because this was so much more powerful for them. And interestingly, the same thing happens with confirmed atheists who encounter 
something. They don't know what it is, but they just know it wasn't supposed to be there. So for the person of faith who says, wait a minute, that isn't the way I thought it was supposed to be, the atheist is saying the same thing. Yes. It's, it's because, you know, in ordinary daily life, we just live so comfortably in this shell of we live in a physical world, material objects, we're surrounded by things we can touch, feel, smell. Um, and suddenly it's like it's like an M and M whose shell is broken mm. and all of a sudden they discover the world out there. And that everything shifts. Everything changes uh, when you suddenly realize there's more, and that <laughs> as um, John Hall in New Hampshire, a uh, psychotherapist, has said, the world is not as I imagined it. The yes, it takes you back to. Um Plato's uh, shadows on the wall, and when you actually catch a glimpse of the real thing, it's overwhelming. Yes, yes. and you can you can never go back to believing that the cave is all there is. Mm. It's like, oh my gosh, it's true. There, there really <laughs> is more. And then in that bewilderment of, uh, now what? How do I live in this in this new understanding? So for people of a religious tradition who think they've lost their faith, um, I, I was thinking about this last night, uh, thinking about our conversation this morning, and thinking it's kind of as if I live my entire life in a particular part of the Atlantic coast. And I think this is what the world is like. And I live in some kind of make-believe um, enclave that says this is the only place that really knows what it's like to be real, to be human. We've got the answers. Mm. And then suddenly I am transported um, what to the well let's say to um, Colorado mm -hmm. in the midst of the the front range of the Rockies and I say no 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 this is not part of the real world this is this is something different this is other mm -hmm. this isn't true and yet they are both part of a much larger reality. I don't know if the metaphor really works, but... Uh, oh, I like it a lot. So if we take the East Coast and your enclave as your religious faith, yeah. and what you were taught, that's that story. And then suddenly you're in Colorado or the Arizona desert. That's a whole different story, but a it's still part of the same... Yes. Exactly. I like that. That's very good, Nancy. Well, how do we tie these two together? Not being, um, uh, we don't have to continue the geog <laughs> geologic or geographical metaphor, but um, because there are times when um, we need both. You know, you have, a, say, you have one near-death experience in your life, and it is uh, illuminating and awe-inspiring, and and may even give you gifts and reassurances that you didn't have before. For. But then, can you go back to your Sunday worship, you know, pick up your Bible and, and feel at home there, too? I think that if you take a patient look, you will find that you not only can find meaning in it, uh, but the meaning will expand and expand and expand. Um, and a 
example, somebody on my Facebook yesterday posted the uh, 2010 Olympics opening ceremony section in which Katie Lang sang Leonard Cohen's Alleluia, mm. which is a dazzling <laughs> piece of music. Yes, and, it and is. As I was listening to the lyric, the lyric is Old Testament based. I mean, I I shared it on my Facebook and said, hey, knowing scripture is a help in all kinds of situations. And here you are at the Olympic opening listening to Katie Lang. And <laughs> You wish you had paid more attention because what in the world do these lyrics mean? Mm. It's the use of the religious words or re religious reference to build a, a song experience that is so much bigger than a story about some guy 4,000 years ago. Mm. It's not just words in a book. They become part of our life experience. And sometimes it takes getting, getting our our. Ordinary perception is just cracked wide open to mm -hmm. see that the Bible lives not just on the level of the childhood stories, but that there are, it, it, it needs elevators. There are so many levels. <laughs> so many levels. <laughs> yes. Well, Leonard Cohen has built a whole musical genre based on inter interweaving the the sensual and the earthly with the with the vocabulary of the Bible, it's and uh, his music is so powerful on that account. Yes, and it it expands. It is. It's not that. Oh, look, listen. He's he's writing a biblical song. No, no, no. He's no. using the Bible as his springboard into human experience. Yes. And he's just very, very lucky to have people like K.B. Lang to express that. Oh, yes. Many people have, have sung his, his music, but never quite as effectively as he does himself, I think. <laughs> I listened to that <laughs> also last night, and it I mean, you can just get blown away. Amazing <laughs> stuff. Well, uh, along these, uh, I guess along the same lines, I'd written down a question here uh, that one of uh, one of my goals in um, as a chaplain is to remind the religious that their uh, fundamental beliefs come from the mystical insights of their founders. Uh, not from um, the laws of behavior that evolve from that, in which the churches like to emphasize on some occasion. And I was wondering, do you see a, a difference between, um, say, putting your faith in Yahweh or putting your faith in the Ten Commandments, or or is it one and the same? Are we uh, are we saved by faith or works? Maybe is what that question comes down to. Um, yes, lighthearted questions for a Monday morning. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I throw one like that at you when we only have a few <laughs> minutes left. <laughs> um, basically, Lee, I think where I rely is on the sense that there is so much in this that is mystery. Mm. I don't... I, I'm I'm not willing to spend my my this life at least um, quibbling over terminology and faith versus works uh, 
um, because I think if you read, here we're back into levels, if you read the the Bible or any scripture with both your mind and your heart open, you will find that both faith and works are imperative if, if we are to live into our full humanity, which if one believes in the God of creation, as I do, whatever that may mean, um, then what, it, it, it's, it's a matter of trust. Do I trust that there is a, I, I hesitate to say purpose, but purpose will do, and that it's written in our holy books and in our religious traditions? Yes. Do I think I am to take those words and those traditions literally for me? Absolutely not. They become the story which tells about people's understanding of the world as they lived in it. And now it's up to us to frame that in the ways that make sense for us, but to do it with integrity and trust. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense to me. Uh I hope um, people can latch on to this, the possibility of this synthesis. Um, so many of uh, our New Age friends have just abandoned the, uh, the traditions of the past, and yet they're losing so much, I think, by, by giving up on that. They've, they, haven't, they haven't, as you say, plumbed the depths. They haven't taken that elevator through all the levels yet. They're taking a very superficial layer and hmm. thinking that's all there is. And sometimes, yes, you have to struggle to get through the that layer. But right. man Which is why I, which is why I think of you as the theologian for the uh, new age and for um the, especially for the N D E. Well this is uh this has been fun, Nancy. We'll have to do it again if that's all right with you. I I love these conversations with you. <laughs> Let's do it again. All right. Next time, perhaps we'll talk about uh, distressing near-death experiences, which is the topic of your really nice book, Dancing Past the Dark. Well, I'll well, look forward to that, but it's nice to have a change of topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, you've been listening to um, us at here at nderadio.org, and you can find us... Um, on our website, this show will be archived along with the others. This is only our second show, so you won't have a lot to listen to. But uh, please join us again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, for more um, near-death experience radio, NDE radio.